may have been classmates. Was Audrey a classmate of yours, Brennan? Yes. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm just going to turn it over to Brennan. And uh, what we'll do is um, at the end, if you have questions, first Fred will ask for questions for those people who are watching in room lecture hall. And then um, if you're joining us via Zoom, type in your question on the chat and I'll call on you, ask you to yourself and um, we can do the, the Zoom chat questions then. So with no further ado, I will turn it over to Brennan. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to give this talk. And uh, as several of my professors back could um, attest for this, I always tended to doze off a little bit in the afternoon classes. So to help with anybody that's like me, we're going to have a, it's going to be a bit more interactive. So I, um, uh, two parts during this talk, I'm going to ask you all to respond um, by chat. And I talked with Fred, uh, for those of y'all in Rune Lecture Hall, um, you can tell your answers to him and then he'll put it in the, um, the chat. So we're, hopefully we can try and do more interaction and dialogue than normally you can get on remotely. So my talk, as the title says, we're going to start with just some basic um, nuclear policy um, challenges that we're going to face in the future. And as somebody that's concerned about the environment, it's very important to know. And then going on from that, we're going to work, uh, look at more of some of my specific projects that I had the opportunity to work on while I've been pursuing a PhD. So that being said, we're going to start with one of these interactive um, questions. And so I would like you all to just type in the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word nuclear. Okay, getting a good, interesting uh, mix here. I'm, I'm impressed. I always like to do that when I um, have a more broad audience than a, at a conference. Um, so yeah, y'all, I've seen a few bombs, but a lot of energy and reactors and power plants and uh, waste and fusion and fission. All right, so um, one thing that I've noticed is that nuclear tends to have a, uh, uh, a uh, nuclear, okay, <laughs> thank you, um, is that everybody tends to have a, well, nuclear has a bad um, rep, rep, so to speak, um, because it was used for bombs and also because of Fukushima and um, Chernobyl before that. But it's actually a very safe energy source. So um, these are death rates from the energy production based off of a terawatt hour and it mainly includes air pollution and accidents so it does include Chernobyl in this one and actually I did a lot of research before this talk looking at the different data and when they included Fukushima it really did not increase that number at all so as you can see that nuclear uh, from a safe energy source standpoint is on par with the other renewables that we're familiar with so it's a very good option for um, CO2 free, CO2 emission free energy source. Um, and so one study actually in environmental engineering, environmental science and technology actually reversed the question and instead they weren't looking at how many deaths it caused, but rather they were looking at how many lives nuclear actually saved when they switched from more coal to nuclear. And so they estimate that just by having nuclear energy, we've saved 1.8 million lives just because of the air pollution that coal releases. So as we go towards more of a renewable energy profile and we want to really reduce CO2 emissions, uh, nuclear should definitely be, be considered. One, because the infrastructure is already there. Right now we're struggling, even though uh, renewables are cheaper now than they were a few years ago, they're still working on the consistency issue, but nuclear is gonna be a consistent power source. So I think that a good combination of nuclear along with the other renewables would be a good 
CO2 emission free energy profile to look for in the future. However, nuclear does have a few drawbacks. One is the cost. So the average cost of a new nuclear plant is $9 billion. And there have other nuclear plants. Um, the bright future is called these mini nuclear plants that they're trying to get licensed and put into production. And so we should all watch out for that. But the other issue is also the waste. So right now we have 90,000 metric tons of high level waste or also the spent nuclear fuel and the materials remaining after reprocessing. So out of that 90,000, 80,000 is from what's called um, commercial waste. And that's just from nuclear power plants that produce energy. So it has no defense waste or government or bombs or any of that. It's just from our energy production. Um, that being said, so I mentioned reprocessing. And so reprocessing is actually recycling for um, spent nuclear fuel waste. So you can take the spent fuel rods and you can isolate out the uranium and plutonium and then you can actually reuse it in another nuclear reactor. And so you get 30% more energy out of your uranium. And so you can save on uranium and it can reduce some of the uranium and plutonium that's left in the waste, which is also a good option. But it is not used for commercial fuel in the US. Uh, the US does use it for defense purposes, but it will not allow it for commercial anymore. But other countries like France and Russia and Japan do reprocess their fuel. So they have it a little bit different. So why doesn't the US do it? Um, the officially, the re reason is for non-proliferation policy. So um, that's to prevent terrorists from possibly getting their hands on the plutonium or uranium during the shipping process or and once it gets isolated from that spent nuclear fuel rod, it is more vulnerable for that. But the real reason anybody in the industry will tell you is cost because one uh, reprocessing plant will cost like $20 billion or no two. So as two plants would cost $20 billion. So that's a lot of money. And it's not like we're exactly short on uranium right now in this country. So that's why the US really did not go with that option for reprocessing. So what's going on with our current waste situation right now, all the spent nuclear fuel is stored on site until a permanent disposal is available. So way back when the DOE promised to take the waste from all the nuclear power plant plants in 1998 and that still hasn't happened so the nuclear power plants got pretty annoyed and started suing the government and it's been costing the government and us taxpayers 500 million dollars a year um, just because they have this nuclear waste still sitting around on site and it's projected to cost 24.7 billion dollars if the situation doesn't change so what's why is it so hard to deal with the spent nuclear waste so this is radioactive radio toxicity my bad level on the left and so and this is years on the x-axis and as you can see it's very radioactive for a very long time and it doesn't reach until natural uranium levels until about over a hundred thousand years so that means it's going to be radioactive and dangerous for that long. So wherever we put the waste, we need to make sure it's going to stay safe for over 100,000 years, which is a very long time. So it's one reason why it's a huge problem. So several committees have decided that the best way to do this is through a deep geological repository. So basically, they take the fuel rods and they put it in a special um, cladding canister um, and they use copper in this model and then for this engineering design they're going to use bentonite clay to try and keep it dry and moisture and this is in a granite rock and then they're going to bury it um, 500 meters below ground and so hopefully the idea is that it will stay safe there for a hundred thousand years so this actual um, design is taken from Sweden and they're very close to opening their um, deep geological repository, but they did have an issue with the licensing, licensing. So it's probably going to take them another 10 years, but Finland is expecting to open theirs in 2024. 
So I haven't mentioned the US because we've kind of fallen behind. Um, I was went to a conference in Barcelona and they had a panel all about deep geological repository and what the different countries were doing with it, with their nuclear waste, sorry. Um, and so there was like France, Germany, Sweden, and they all had these great plans and talking about their deep geological repository while the poor guy up from the US, I kind of felt bad for him and he was basically sitting there well, we're not sure what we're doing anymore. So it was kind of embarrassing, but this is the current political situation on what the US is doing with their spent nuclear fuel. So it started back in 1982 with the Nuclear Waste Policy Act. And so the plan was to actually build two repositories, one on the east side of the country and one on the west, and it'd be 70,000 tons each. So remember, we've got 90,000 tons of this stuff. So that would even as we keep going with nuclear and have more fuel, uh, spent fuel to dispose of, that should be enough to cover us with 140 tons, at least for a while. So then in 1987, I'm not sure exactly why, though I do know uh, the senator from my home state of Louisiana was a big proponent of this and pushed it forward. You had this amendment act, which is also called the Screw Nevada Bill. So instead of having two repositories, they decided we're only gonna have one and we're only gonna investigate it at this one site in Nevada and not really look at any place else. And so that was called Yucca Mountain. So it was a pretty bad idea because they were only gonna make it 70,000 tons. And even back then we had more waste than 70,000 tons. And how do you think Nevada felt? I'm pretty uh, not happy about that. And so they, um, the Department of Energy went on and they started investigating the likelihood of Yucca Mountain to be our deep geological repository. And they submitted it for licensing, licensing by the NRC. But um, the political pressure from a, a Nevada senator actually kind of terminated that in 2010. And they said, no, we don't wanna be the nuclear waste dump of the US. So now I think if we stuck to that original plan and had two repositories on different side of the countries, I think, Nevada would have felt a little less singled out. So um, then after that, they're like, okay, we're not sure what we're gonna do with it. And as I mentioned, the nuclear companies started suing the government. And because of that, they're like, okay, let's look at Yucca Mountain again and resume licensing. So the NRC did do that. And they're like, hey, this place actually kind of meets a lot of our regulations, but we're gonna need more money to continue investigating it. And so then they ran out of money and uh, they haven't been given any money. So the current um, administration has tried to license, um, push the licensing through for Yucca Mountain, but Congress has not provided the funding yet. So personally, I've talked to several scientists that did work on the Yucca Mountain project. And some of them think that the site was good and it would have worked for 100,000 years. And then some of them also think it was not a good idea and that we could find a better site. Um, I kind of agree with the people that think we could find a better site. I think the geology was good, but the problem is they had a little bit of a moisture problem. So in the engineering design, they thought it was necessary to add like a steel drip shield to try and keep water off the canisters. And I have a feeling that's not gonna last for 100,000 years. So I think we can do better. So right now that's, um, we talked a lot about more of the commercial waste. And so that's basically all on site at the power plants. And it's in these pretty indestructible canisters. But now when you think of the nuclear waste and the sludge and the everything leaking into the watershed, that's actually doesn't really come too much from the power plants. That's all nice and contained. It comes from the legacy waste. So that's basically the Manhattan Project and all the work we did in the Cold War when we were just cared about making bombs and weapons, and we didn't know what we were doing exactly. So some of the um, waste, we have 90 million gallons of radioactive waste in these underground tanks. Um, the problem is these tanks are leaking. And so uh, 90 million gallons is a lot. That's the equivalent of over 136 Olympic sized pools. And so because a lot of these tanks are leaking, that's gonna cause 1.7 trillion gallons of contaminated groundwater. And um, there's also obviously leaking coming from other sources as well. And then that's also 40 million meters cubed of contaminated soil and debris. So where is all this contamination? 
Um, oh, sorry. Um, so this is um, a lot of the DOE sites and where they're located. So I first saw this map when I was a senior at Alfred. And if you look up in New York, there's actually a nice little radioactive hut really close to where Alfred should be. So I looked it up and that's the West Valley, New York reprocessing site. So remember reprocessing is like that recycling for nuclear fuel and you're dissolving the fuel rod. So you actually produce some pretty nasty liquid radioactive waste. And um, the West Valley site was the US's only commercial reprocessing before they said, we're not gonna allow commercial reprocessing. And it was very poorly mismanaged. And the site really wasn't a good location because that area is very erosive. So they had some of those tanks and then the you know, soil eroded and the tanks are leaking and it's moving towards the stream. And um, that is like one hour and 15 minute drive from Alfred. So that, is something that y'all sh should be aware of and just keep an eye on it. They're remediating it, um, but they're not done with it yet. So they're trying to control it. So uh, why study uranium in particular? We have a joke in our lab that everybody has their favorite radionuclide and uranium is mine. And um, one of the reasons is because it's the most common radionuclide in soils at the DOE facilities. Um, there's over 126 sites contaminated with uranium in the country in 36 states. So it's a very widespread issue. And most of this is from mining and milling and the nuclear um, energy and weapons production as well. And then uranium is also just found naturally in um, the soil as well. So there are some sites, I believe like uh, an area around here, they just have naturally high uranium that gets in the water sometimes. So some basic chemistry about uranium, it's oxidation states three to four, uh, three to six, sorry. But the only environmentally relevant ones are uranium four and uranium six. So uranium four is under reducing conditions and it's pretty much immobile. It's not gonna move. It's either gonna be absorbed or it's gonna be an insoluble uraninite. And so then uranium six is in oxidizing conditions and that's gonna be very mobile and it's that solid, uh, uranyl ion right there. Um, so how's the best way to remediate? One idea that uh, is very commonly used is to just reduce the uranium and, and keep it in reducing conditions either by um, inputting certain uh, metals to help at, uh, increase that reducing environment or doing it by um, bio remediation and using certain microbes to keep those reducing conditions. But the problem with that is that if it gets oxidized again, then the uranium is going to be mobile again. So in oxidizing conditions, another strategy is to make a urinal phosphate. So um, you precipitate a urinal phosphate either by adding phosphate to the ground, or also you can do it with a, that particular microbe, and there's other ones as well. So pros about this is that it's stable under oxidizing conditions. So you don't have to worry about redox at all, which is great. And it also precipitates faster and it's very non-soluble compared to other uranium-6 minerals. Um, but the con is that it can be dissolved by organic ligands and also carbonate species. So at a very high pH where you think you're gonna have carbonate um, like at the Hanford site, that might not be the best way to go for this. So some very common your, um, uranyl phosphate minerals are shunicovite, and as you can see with that log KSP value on the right, um, it is one of the more soluble. So the less negative the log KSP is, the more soluble the mineral is going to be. And so um, as you go down, you can see like odnite's very similar chemical formula, except instead of the hydronium atom, you have the calcium. And then you also have the sodium odnite below that. And you can see that these are a lot um, less soluble than the shernicovite. So where can urinal phosphates be found? Um, they are, right now, um, they've just formed kind of naturally at Oak Ridge with some of their um, uranium contamination and also at the Fernald site in Ohio. And what they found is that these urinal phosphates aren't are actually keeping the uranium in place and naturally not letting it move. So that's when they realize that this might be a good remediation strategy. 
So the one that I focus mainly on is Chernikovite. So um, it forms very, very quickly. And so in nature, if you're pumping in that phosphate into the ground, this would probably be the first mineral that's going to form. And then the other ones might form with weathering. So, um, sorry. Uh, on the left, you can see the molecular structure, and it's actually a layered substance. So it's kind of similar to a few of the clays. And so you have this water inner layer with the hydronium ion. And then on the left, you have the SEM images. Um, it's relatively small, like one micrometer, and very consistent. And on um, the middle is basically how I make it. So you just add some sodium hydrogen phosphate and some uranyl nitrate. And as soon as you just mix those together, it instantly forms. And so on the right is the x-ray diffraction pattern. And um, so you can see that's what I got from my mineral. And right below that is the Stranikovite reference. So the match is pretty good. All right, so organic ligands and uranyl phosphates. Um, organic ligands, we should be worried about them because they're co-contaminated with a lot of the radionuclides and they're also produced by microorganisms and also plant roots. So um, you had think of a plant root in the ground and it's gonna want some nutrients like um, iron or phosphorus and it's gonna send out its, um, some of these organic ligands to dissolve these minerals so it can access these nutrients that it needs. So that's the complex relationship between ligands, phosphate minerals, and plants. As a colleague of mine did this really cool study, and she actually found when you have an insoluble phosphate mineral, the plant's more likely to produce more ligands. So if you had an insoluble urinal phosphate in the ground, then the plant's gonna produce more of these organic ligands, and then it could actually remobilize that previously non-mobile urinal phosphate. And so the ligand that I focus on is citrate, and you can see the molecular structure below. All right, so this is another participation one. Um, so why study different scales? So if you like, um, if you remember those highlights or uh, um, Zumas from that cranium game, we're gonna, look at these two images and I'd like y'all to tell me what you think they are. We'll start with the number one because that one's a lot easier. So if you can put in chat what you think number one is, that'd be great. Yep, yep, I see it, y'all got it right. Football, so that's pretty easy one, very distinctive. So let's try and do number two, what's number two? I had a really hard time with this one. <laughs> okay, um, I'll give you the answer because I didn't get it. I thought it was like marble or something, but it's actually a zoomed in wine cork. So what does this tell us about scale? Um, two things is sometimes in experiments, it's very hard to um, do the big field scale experiment. It takes a lot of money and time, and sometimes you don't even have just the opportunity um, because you don't have control in the field. So instead we do these little laboratory experiments and we try to use them to predict what um, is, happens at the larger field scale. So some instances like the football, it was very easy. We could do a small scale experiment and say, okay, this should easily translate and we can see how it does in the large scale. But on the other time, sometimes it's a lot harder, like the wine cork. Um, and then also in reverse, if you want to look at the football and say, hey, I wonder how it's easy to grip, you're gonna have to get a zoomed in look and really see the leather um, to be able to figure that out. So that's why it's important to study different scales. Um, so what I'm using different scales for is mainly to look at how uranium moves and looking at different matrices. So I start with the batch. And so that's basically a test tube. So I have some urinal phosphate and I have some citrate and I'm going to see what happens. So that's just the behavior and the extent of the reaction. Then I got to work with these really cool um, technique um, called micromodels. And so they're really, really tiny. And we used our micromodel to simulate um, like pores. 
And so we were able to look at how the reaction um, would change with transport phenomena like flow and diffusion and um, other things like that. And so then we moved on to field lysimeters. And so that's actually like just kind of a really big column with uh, soil. And we also added plants in there too to see what happens. And then finally, you can take all of this to field surveying. So um, that's real world application, but as we mentioned, field surveying is difficult as um, my colleague is standing right by a beaver dam, uh, beaver dam, which prevented us from surveying the rest of our area because of that. So, um, and then also you have the time, the time component. So all the way on the other scale, that batch experiment took like 12 hours, the micro model took 48, the field lysimeters took two years, and while well, the field surveying, that was several weeks um, of actual surveying, but the uranium's been moving there for um, 50 years almost. So um, we're going to look at the urinal phosphate dissolution hypothesis. So um, that's what I'm doing with the batch, the micromodel, and the lysimeters. So what I expected for the would happen would be that uranium concentrations would increase with increasing citrate concentrations. So you expect a two-step mechanism where you have the citrate, it's going to bind to the urinal phosphate very quickly, and then it's going to leave the urinal phosphate surface and rejoin the solution as a urineal citrate complex. Um, so if only that was happening, you would expect as citrate concentrations increase, you have a direct correlation with dissolved uranium concentrations. So that's what I did in the batch, is I just put some urinal phosphate solid in different test tubes with the different citrate concentrations. And these are the results that I received. So as you can see, it does increase um, for a good bit until like 10 millimolar citrates. And then the nice, um, it's actually almost linear when you get there. And then once you get to 10, you can see that the, it doesn't increase as much as you're increasing the citrate concentration. So at these higher citrate concentrations, the ligand is no longer as effective at dissolving the uranium concentrations. So that is very different from my hypothesis. Um, but what was also pretty cool is how well the 12 hour um, sampling agreed with the one week sampling. So you didn't see much variation in ura uh, the dissolved uranium concentrations, even when you were given more time. So the black line in this, uh, this graph is based on some chemical equilibrium modeling. So basically you put in the species and it predicts the most likely species that's going to happen during those conditions. And so the model predicted that you're actually getting a secondary phase precipitation of a urinal phosphate. And that is, um, could be what's causing this to decrease and not keep increasing with citrate. So why doesn't the line match exactly my data? And we think that maybe with more time, um, the, ur the urinal phosphates could um, possibly precipitate out if given maybe several weeks, months even. So conclusions from the batch experiments are thinking back to these mechanisms of how does the citrate dissolve this shernikovite? We know that it's not this simple two-step mechanism where it absorbs and it's quickly off. So there's two ideas is that um, the citrate binds to the urinal phosphate, but at high citrate concentrations, it actually is unable to completely go out into the solution because the citrate is just completely saturating the surface and preventing release. And so you're getting almost an alteration layer with a very strong urinal citrate interaction. And then the third mechanism would be that it actually does first go to the surface and then, then it does release, but you're getting the secondary phase precipitation of a solid again. And so it's falling out of solution. So micromodels are finally called labs on chips and they are more of a two dimensional study and the people really like them and they're excited because they provide this nice link between batch scale and larger scale experiments because they allow you to simulate flow through a porous material and you can also look at effects of mass transfer and dispersion on chemical reactions.
So just to give you an idea on the size, you know, those cylinders are just 300 micrometers long, and that's a micromodel by a mechanical pencil. So they're very, very small. So I actually got to do these experiments at Pacific Northwest National Labs, which are located in Washington State in the Hanford site. And when I first thought I was going to Washington, I'm like, ooh, all the forest and very rainy. But no, that's on the western side of Washington. The eastern side is actually a desert. Um, but it was still a lot of fun, and I really like that area. So the experimental design, first I precipitated the uranyl phosphate inside three micromodels to set up the dissolution experiments that I was going to run for three different citrate concentrations. So at this point, it was just, um, reproducing the exact same method. So I put in the phosphate through inlet A and the uranyl in inlet B, and then they meet at the center mixing line and form a precipitate. The problem was that they didn't, there wasn't, they didn't form a consistent precipitate. So for the micromodel that I was going to use for the 10 millimolar citrate, you see this fine powder and a similar one for the 0.1 millimolar citrate. But in the micromodel that I was going to use for the no citrate, you see these bigger clumps um, of the solid also with this dusting. So we're not really sure um, what could possibly cause this because we did the exact same procedure for all three. So we think that there might be like some dust particles in the micromodels that are affecting the precipitation um, and crystallization of the solid because crystals are very sensitive. So um, uh, we'll need further study and it kind of shakes our, um, this up, this idea that micromodels have perfect control over because clearly we do not. So then the second part was the pore blockage test. So I pumped in some fluorescent dye um, through one end and I did that first with the no precipitant. And so the end with the dye was at like 100 microliters per an hour flow rate. And then the one without the dye was 50 microliters. So you expect the dye to cross the center mixing line. But what was really cool was after we precipitated out the solid along that center mixing line, the dye didn't cross for nine pores, which means that the solid was completely blocking these nine pores and it was gonna, it changes the flow dynamic of the model. So then we're going to do the dissolution part. So I'm going to pump citrate through one of the inlets for 48 hours and sodium chloride solution for the other, just to see the control and the work of the diffusion of the citrate moving through the model. Um, and so I did three citrate, well, two citrate concentrations in a control with um, just sodium chloride. And the flow rate was 40 microliters per an hour and the retention time is 1.88 minutes. So why should you care about the retention time? That's gonna be how long the citrate has to react with the um, solid before it leaves the micromodel in the cell. So that's a very short retention time. So the dissolution uh, section, as you can see, um, and these zoomed in images, you can look at, uh, get a better idea of how the solid forms first at, um, before the citrate was introduced. And you actually see some second lines of the urinal phosphate. But the citrate does make pretty quick work of the um, solid and you can see it dissolved at 23 hours and then even more so at the 47 hours. So it's a pretty quick dissolution. We were able to monitor the dissolved uranium concentrations out of the effluent of the micromodel. And uh, you can see the 10 millimolar citrate dissolved a lot more than the 0.1 millimolar citrate. But the surprise was that the no citrate actually had higher dissolved uranium concentrations than the 0.1 millimolar citrate. And so we hypothesize that that's back to um, the the different form of that solid in that no citrate micro model. They had that really fine powder at the bottom, even though they had the bigger size solid. And we believe that really fine powder kind of dissolved out even with just the 10, um, with the sodium chloride in solution. And so um, because the solid is trapped in the micro model, you're limited on the solid phase characterization you can do. But we were able to do ramen, which is, um, uh, basically another way of just fingerprinting um, a chemical by using vibrational or rotational spectrum. So the phosphate, um, you can see the phosphate peak right there um, is very prevalent in 
the before the citrate and um, you have a nice urinal peak also as well. But after citrate exposure, um, the phosphate peak is barely there, it really flattens and you also see a shift in the urinal peak. So we went back to lab and I made more um, solids and exposed it to citrate and um, ran ramen on it. So starting with this black line at the zero millimolar citrate, um, you can see a nice urinal peak and the um, phosphate peak was a little hard to get just with that particular sample. But once you go up to that 0.1 millimolar citrate, you're seeing especially a shift in this urinal peak. You get a second peak here coming and a smaller peak there. And then once you get to one millimolar citrate, um, being ex um, a urinal phosphate exposed to that one millimolar citrate, you see a complete shift in this urinal peak. So I uh, made a friend basically at a conference and um, he did some really cool theoretical calculations for me. Um, and so basically he took a urinal phosphate and he figured uh, did ran different models to see how the citrate could interact with it. And then he used that to predict what the Raman spectra would look like. And so the one that worked the best was a uh, one to two urineal to citrate ratio and it's interacting with the middle carboxylic acid group. And so on the bottom right here you can see his prediction for the no citrate which matches my um, just urinal phosphate pretty well. And then up here you can see his prediction for with the citrate and you can also see that peak uh, shift in that uh, urinal peak. So that was pretty cool whenever um, your experiments match the theoretical simulations. So the conclusions from the micromodel experiments is that we are probably getting some of this um, urinal citrate alteration layer, the fact that we can see the citrate interacting with the urinal on the solid uh, with ramen. All right, so the third one is the field lysimeter. So basically at these PVC pipes that we packed with a ratio of soil and sand, and we put plants in some of them, and then we put them out in this really big dumpster with concrete in it. And so if you can see the pipes coming out of the big dumpster, that's to catch the effluent. And so we can um, analyze it. So deploying the lysimeters was a lot of fun um, because carrying up the lysimeters were very hard. So instead we got creative and we used the forklift and then the extension of the forklift and that wasn't quite enough. So we jerry rigged our own little flagpole and we hung the lysimeters off of that and lifted it up and then brought it over to our really big dumpster. So uh, I did five different lysimeters uh, with varying sources. So we had a no source um, for a control and then we had just a shernikovite and then we had a shernikovite and a sodium 22. So um, with this shernikovite, I synthesized it with an extra 10 milligrams of uranium 235 because the soil has an actual hot, naturally high ratio, um, high concentration of uranium just naturally in the soil. So by spiking my shernikovite with an extra uranium-235, I was able to alter the ratio enough so that um, I'll be able to detect what's my shernikovite versus the uranium naturally in the soil. So then we also have um, two with plants and three without plants. And then we also have various different sensors um, also attached to the lysimeters that can give us water content and um, mass content. And then also these electrode arrays, which are, can really tell you where in the column the water is passing through. So it can check for preferential flow pathways. Um, so challenges, because you don't have problems in research, you only have challenges. Um, is how to pack the lysimeters. So previous lysimeters done at the Savannah River site, they used the okay packing method. And as you can see, once it got above um, towards the top, you can see where they added the more soil and you can also see a nice preferential pathway on this extra. So we did, were trying to avoid preferential pathways and we did this proctor method packing and it ended up backfiring um, because we packed it a little too well. And even though we don't have any preferential pathways in the soil, we also packed it so well that the roots, instead of growing through the soil and getting close to my source in the middle of the column, they decided to grow around the soil and through the um, 
by on the side of the PVC pipe. Um, so some of these moisture probes, this is just um, data that you can see. And what you would expect is that the bottom would be the most saturated because it just never will completely dry, so to speak. Um, th these were packed already sort of saturated. And um, the top should vary, um, but probably be more on the drier end because it's exposed to the environment more. Um, so for Chewy, you can see that the bottom isn't always the wettest. So that's an uh, indication that there might be something a little different going on with there. But uh, another lysimeter right next to Chewy is Han. And um, as you can see, the bottom is the, it's as expected. So we also did a soil profile. And uh, you can see where the uranium did not move very much. You get a little bit of um, travel up just from diffusion and a little bit of travel down. And there was, really was no coordination with the iron. But the really exciting part comes with the x-ray diffraction. So there's the original source um, that I measured in 2017 and 2019 and the uh, um, matches the Schoenickerite reference. And then right above that you have the source that we recovered from uh, the lysimeter. And you can see a peak shift in that very first peak. So what we're thinking is that um, maybe some potassium got into that inner layer and is actually causing that a different space in that inner layer. Uh, we also looked at some transition electron microscope images as well. And you can um, see that it's definitely more weathered and edged, which could be like I said, or maybe a cation is getting in between that inner layer. So the conclusion from the lysimeters is that um, it could be more of this um, secondary phase precipitation that we're forming almost a second urinal phosphate phase as well. All right, I don't know if I have time um, to do this, um, but really quick, I'll um, just show you this video of a really cool project we did at Savannah River site. From 1954 until 1989, work at the Savannah River Sites M area resulted in uranium process waste that was directly disposed into sewer outfalls, leading to the Thames Branch Waterway. With funding from the Department of Energy's Office of Science Subsurface Biochemical Research Program, a team from SRNL, Argonne National Laboratory, Clemson University, the U University of Georgia's Savannah River Ecology Laboratory and others is now studying the 43,000 kilograms of low-level uranium that's concentrated in wetlands there. So this is a project looking at why wetlands are so effective at attenuating uh, contaminants when they're released into the environment. By attenuating, what I mean is why do wetlands have this ability to concentrate contaminants what makes this particularly interesting is that the contaminants move roughly two kilometers before it hit this wetland. And then once it hit the wetland, it started concentrating. So the question that we're asking is why did it not get attenuated near the source? Instead, it got attenuated right in this wetland. To help find the answers, a team from SRS, Clemson, the SR Ecology Lab, and Augusta University are performing walkover gamma surveys of the right. affected area. Right. The walkover survey, which poses no health risk due to the type and the low levels of radiation, will provide data with 500 times higher resolution than earlier helicopter overflight mapping. And one of the things we want to know is how accurate are those helicopter readings? Can you do a higher resolution map by walking with these backpacks? And so we got to cover a lot of area in this wetland, and to do that, we need a lot of people. And so we're bringing down small armies of students every couple of months and walking different areas in the wetland, and eventually we'll cover the majority of it. So there's nine of us that were out in the field at a given time. So you had the backpack with the gamma detector. We had a tablet that had GPS uh, associated with it. And 
very sequentially. We went over the, the contaminated area. And what happens is this instrument takes a measurement every second. And in real time, you can actually see how much radioactivity is going on. The research is also helping with DOE workforce development. Well, University really students currently studying health, physics, geochemistry, and radiochemistry get real-world, hands-on experience. You know, it's, it's neat to get to be able to do work out in the field like this. This is something I've always really enjoyed, and I think that it's great for students to see that in at least a health physics career, your job can sometimes have your office be walking around with a backpack for, you know, a few days, and that's a really nice change of pace. I think it's a really good experience to get to be out here and see that. The walkover and flyover gamma surveys provide two-dimensional mapping. Samples are also being sent to the DOE's Argonne National Laboratory in Illinois for synchrotron light sources measurements. ANL. All right, so that's pretty much the gist of it, and it's just a closer up look at some of the um, equipment that we had. Um, and yeah. So then the takeaway though is some of those core samples that they took. Um, so they took a soil core of it and then looked at it with depth. And you can actually see a nice um, coordination between the iron, uranium, and the organic matter. So that kind of connects back to all these lab experiments that we were doing is that you're seeing enhanced dissolution of uranium in the presence of organic matter. All right. Um, there. Um, this is just for anybody that's interested in summer research internships. I would um, just recommend Googling whatever internship you think you can come up with, and I guarantee they have one for it. Um, and for those of you that are seen, uh, juniors getting ready to go into senior year, I'd recommend at least trying to do a, one for going abroad, um, and there are some resources for that. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge uh, my advisor, Dr. Brian Powell, and our group, and the people at PNNL, and also Savannah River for making this possible. All right. Questions now. Sorry, I went over by a lot. That's okay. Thanks, Brennan. Um, let's start with uh, if there's any um, questions in Rune Lecture Hall. Anybody has any questions? I think we're all digesting the chemistry right now. So uh, sorry, I try to keep it somewhat light. <laughs> we'll go to. Uh, you should probably go to uh, other sources of question, Michelle. Okay, I noticed that Alex Claire had a question. All right. So if you want citrate precipitation, can you add a nucleation agent to encourage crystallization? Um, I don't know if I completely understand. Um, the question because we don't exactly want citrate precipitation um we're trying to would we would like the uranyl phosphate to stay a uranyl phosphate and we're finding out that citrate is making it difficult to some extent for it to remain a uranyl phosphate the reason i asked a question was because you said that you thought some dust particles were causing the precipitation so okay. that sounds to me like they're nucleating it. Okay, okay, yeah, for, for making our um, uranyl phosphate in the micro model. Um, mm. Yeah, so we, we could try and do that, but by um, doing that, we would be introducing more chemicals into the system, and then we wouldn't be sure exactly what the solid would be after. And without being able to do that really heavy solid characterization, we might have trouble with that. Um, but that's what I was supposed to go back to PNNL this summer and figure out some of those questions, but that didn't happen. Okay, other questions for Brennan? Are you liking graduate school? Um, <laughs> it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Um, you are right. never bored. If you want something where you're never bored, go to grad school. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. There's a question from Bowers who had to leave for another meeting. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's for me. Okay. Okay. Any, anybody else? All right. Well, oh, go ahead. Did you have one, Bill? 
Yeah, just real quick. You had mentioned uh, the the testing site in upstate New York, or the not testing site, but the yeah. nuclear. Um, it was on the map. Yeah. Yeah, it's you a West it's Valley a poor location because of erosion and precipitation. Is there any places on the East Coast that you think would have been a better choice, or do you think that they picked the best one available and it still isn't good enough? Um, for a reprocessing plant, I think yes, they could have um, picked a better. It, it was just like the area, if you go and look at Google Maps, there's a lot of creeks and streams all around it. And so it just was like the Cold War era and not a lot of thought put, was put into it to worry about what happens if this gets into the environment. It's, it was a different time back then. They were more worried about the Russians bombing us. So that's where a lot of our legacy waste comes from is just they not knowing or be not caring would almost be the word to use. So that leaves us to clean up with it, unfortunately. Okay, um, Dr. D'Angelo gave me a very uh, a really long, long one. <laughs> okay. Um, the top, yeah, the. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the uh, I'll give you the paper. And from what I could tell, they tried to um, be inclusive, especially of Fukushima and Chernobyl, um, the accidents. But if I would have to point a finger to something that they might have skipped is uranium mining is still not exactly the safest occupation. And so I spent way too much time digging into this for the talk. And um, I really don't think they included any um, instances of harm from uranium mining in that paper. But and it was very hard to find the numbers. Would is uranium mining any dangerous than coal mining? And so I spent at least an hour trying to find those numbers, and I couldn't. So, um, but yeah, I'll give you that paper to look at. Yeah, I think it's sometimes hard. I mean, with coal mining, you can point to things like black lung and certain um, definite uh, yes. physiological problems. But with uranium mining, just if someone develops a cancer, is it because they're a uranium miner, or is it? Because they, they smoke, that cancer anyway. you, if they smoke, you, yeah, yeah, you can't do yeah, it. So. And that they're also finding that with um, Fukushima, actually. Um, Japan only has linked one death to the actual meltdown on radioactive release. Um, they have a, maybe about 500, but they account that to the stress of having to evacuate. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, well, let's thank Brendan and... Um, um, quickly before we do, just next week's talk is David Tomio from class of uh, 1993, and we'll be talking about Denali National Park, a living laboratory in Alaska. But in the meantime, it's so good to see you again, Brennan. You haven't changed a bit, and thank you very much. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see a bunch of you guys next week.